I finished high school, I actually didn't really know what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a teacher or a politician or a counsellor. High school, I was just not a particularly great student. I actually didn't do very well in my A-levels, so I didn't get to go to university. I took a year off and then I went to a polytechnic, which is a much more practical learning experience. I didn't relate to science because I couldn't see myself being a scientist. I did have one teacher say to me that I'd never do anything related to science. And um, usually when someone tells me that I can't do something, it usually gives me the incentive to actually want to do it. Biology was my favourite subject, but I just wasn't very good at it. I started thinking maybe, you know, science isn't the right area for me, but I guess the reality is there are so many different avenues, different parts of science. It doesn't all have to be looking through a microscope. I would never want anyone to get put off looking at STEM subjects because they don't like maths or they don't like what they've learned you know, traditionally at school. The way we look at STEM now is that it's literally through everything. The STEM subjects are essentially the fundamental ones for changing the world. Science and engineering themselves are so evolving and iterative that we probably don't even know what the careers in science and engineering of the future look like. You sort of have this idea in high school that you're going to pick something to study and that's what you'll do and you make that decision. The reality is opportunities come up you need to keep your eyes open and see what's out there. So I did actually spend a lot of time reading through the, the job prospectuses and reading about every certain job that was out there. I spent time at the universities researching what courses were available to study. My mum wanted me to be a doctor. I really don't want to be around too much blood day to day. And when I went to a few open days at some universities, I learned about biomedical engineering. Well, that's a really cool way to apply engineering to the human body. I didn't always think I'd be a scientist. It took a break actually, I decided I actually like art um, and I went to art school. After a year of doing art school, I just felt like, no, it, it's actually science. It's a great thing to just think, I really like this, try it and it's fine to change. So I'm really glad I pursued my passion because clearly I've been able to have a great career with what I was interested in doing. Well, good afternoon and welcome to this Academy of Technology and Engineering and Stellar webcast. This is the second in our series and this one's called From Implants to Jet Planes. And in the spirit of reconciliation, the Academy wishes to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and particularly on the lands we're meeting and their connection to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples present today and signed into this webcast. My name is Camille Thompson and I am the National Program Coordinator for Stella and I'm here to MC our event today. Today we're going to hear from two fantastic Victorian engineers. Firstly, Associate Professor Kate Fox from RMIT University who is a biomedical engineer and secondly, Dr. Daniel Edgington Mitchell, who's from Monash University, who's a mechanical and aerospace engineer. I uh, wanted to let you know there are question boxes on the screens that you're watching. Please feel free to put your questions in at any time during the webcast. We will be doing questions at the end, but please put them in at any time and we'll definitely get to them. There's also a chat box if you wanted to share your thoughts with the rest of the viewing audience. Uh, we really want to hear from you, so please feel free to put all of your thoughts and excitements into those boxes. <laughs> so firstly, I'm going to introduce Associate Professor Kate Fox, uh, who's going to speak to you a little bit about her work. So uh, good afternoon, Kate. Good afternoon now. <laughs> it is afternoon, <laughs> amazingly. Uh, so I'm just going to let you go and, and talk to us a little bit about what it means to be an engineer for you and the work that you're working on. Awesome. Thank you very much. So obviously I'm, I'm in Melbourne, so I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people as well, um, both past, present and emerging. So I guess you're, you're sitting here wondering wh why should I, I bother with engineering? Um, and I guess I'll, I'll sort of talk you through how I ended up where I am 
and why I made certain decisions at a certain point. So when I was at high school, I really had no idea what I wanted to do. I had thought about being a doctor um, and that sort of stuff, but you know, I really didn't have the aptitude or you know, the ability to stand on my feet for long periods of time to be you know, the orthopedic surgeon that I would have gone down the path to be if I'd taken that route. But then I, I had to think about you know, what were my strengths and I wanted to find a career that I could, I guess, use my hands. Um, I did like maths, but I will keep telling everyone until you, know, you stop listening that maths is not the be all and end all to be an engineer. You don't have to be a, a math genius. You don't have to even like maths. There's plenty of types of engineering that require very little maths at all. But I, I did like maths. Um, what I didn't like, though, was back when I was in high school, we did maths one and maths two. And I hated maths two so deeply that there was no way I was ever going to waste having spent a year of my life doing um, you know, doing maths two and circle theory and all that sort of stuff. The other big driver was, you know, like most of us, I'd grown up watching lots of movies, lots of science fiction. And I always liked that idea that technology could, you know, go inside the body and, you know, make superhumans and, you know, cyborg robots like the Terminator. And I guess as I've gone through my career, I keep reflecting on those movies I watched as a kid. And, you know, it could be as simple as, you know, face off where John Travolta and Nicolas Cage at some point swap faces using some, you know, complex bioprinting um, technique or, you know, look at, at Jurassic Park where they're, they're printing out the voice box of, you know, velociraptors to try and, you know, blow the horn and get all the dinosaurs to come in. So, you know, 3D printing was something that always intrigued me that I didn't really have an opportunity to do when I was at high school because it wasn't really a thing. And I'll, I'll come back to that a bit later. So as I said, I now work in sort of 3D printing um, as a biomedical engineer. So what we try to do is, you know, take complex medical conditions or um, issues and then be able to use 3D printing to, you know, rectify that the best we can. So we're all pretty familiar with 3D printing. You know, basically you start with nothing, you design it on a computer and then layer by layer, you can print a structure. Why that matters in you know, medical technology is that you know, the printers we have you know, are, are a bit more uh, complex than the, the MakerBots or the Zortrax you might have it in, inside your schools. We can actually print things out of metal. And the way we do that is that we have a whole um, bed full of metal powder, and then we can use a laser that melts it and centers it layer by layer to make you know, complex parts that can be hollow, that can be shaped, however you like. So if you look at something like someone has fallen over and broken their arm, or they've been diagnosed with a, bro a bone cancer, so an osteosarcoma, what usually happens is, you know, the surgeon will go, gee, that's bad, I need to remove some bone, I need to be able to get that cancer out or, you know, fix that, that break. And what they do is, particularly with cancers, they'll go in and they'll cut away a whole heap of healthy bone, go down to the, you know, the local implant supplier and say, okay, I've now removed you know, half of the pelvis, what do you have on your shelf? And then they'll come home and they'll say, okay, here's a, an implant. It won't fit perfectly. So the surgeon will, will literally be there in the operating theater, bending it and adding screw holes and all sorts of things to try and make it fit into the patient they're trying to treat. What we can do now is the person who have cancer, um, they'll take the same amount of bone, but we can then scan using MRI or CT technology, so computer tomography technology, and design from scratch an implant that fits just that patient. So that when they go and they put the new implant in, they're minimizing the amount of good bone they're having to remove. They're getting an implant that looks exactly like the one that has just, you know, the bone that's just been replaced. And it gives that really cool personalized technology. After all, you know, we all want something that's been made just for you. The other cool thing about printing is that we're not only printing in things like metals now. I work a lot in you know, hard tissues and I'll talk a bit later about I use things like diamond in my 3D printing. But what you may have heard of is another field where they're using bioprinting, so biological materials. So it can be cells, it can be you know, gels and all sorts of stuff um, to replace body parts. And occasionally you sort of see popped up on the computer screen or the TV, you know, someone has now printed a heart. No one can print a heart. A heart is such a complex organ 
that you know, just even getting the blood flow into a artificial, you know, bioprinted heart is, is next to impossible at the moment. However, it's not going to be impossible forever. And that's where you guys come in because you're the ones who will take all these technologies and build them into something really cool, really out there. You know, I don't think in your lifetime you'll be printing a human, but I think in your lifetime you'll be the ones who'll be out there, you know, printing the organs, printing skin, printing all those cool things that we would only ever dream of. Because if you look back when I was in high school, um, we barely had the internet. I think there was one computer in the library where you could access Netscape. There was no emails. You know, Google was only really starting up. In, high, in, in university, you know, all our mechanical drawings were done by hand. We had no, you know, computer-aided drawings or CAD softwares. It was a really different um, way of living. And now these things are, you know, common knowledge. It's part of everyone's lives. Everyone's heard of 3D printing, but it just wasn't a thing you know, back when I was in school. So you've got to think about, you know, engineering is going to equip you for all these technologies and all these solutions to problems that, you know, don't exist yet. Well, look at bioprinting, you know, at the moment, you know, the best we can probably do is, you know, we can print cartilage so we can make ears. Um, but that's really more of just making sort of a, a scaffold or a skeleton for, you know, cells to grow into. We can print skin, we can print hollow tubes. But anything more complex than that, you know, is really a few years away at least. So how did I get to this point? So I, I'm a South Australian, so I did a double degree in biomedical engineering and um, a Bachelor of Science. So I'm one of these silly people that likes to collect degrees as I go. And the reason I chose that, as I said, is I wanted to be able to, you know, help people. I wanted to be able to interface with the human body but I wanted to have fun doing it. And I wanted to be you know, on projects where I can turn on the, the TV and you know, feel proud that I've made a real difference to someone's lives. And as I go, I'll sort of talk about some of these projects that I did. What I most definitely did was I, I kept trying to diversify. I didn't want to sort of end up being you know, a very narrow-minded, narrowly educated person. So when I was going through my, my undergrad, I was looking at doing projects in really crazy fields. So I did my honours in electronic warfare. So I was designing antenna systems to be able to, you know, do some defence applications. Um, and I had every intention of, sort of continuing down that path. But then when I finished my undergraduate engineering degree, I was lucky enough to be offered a PhD, so further study um, in implants. So working with a company over in Sydney, Portland Orthopaedics, they were looking for someone to take what was their metal implants and find a, a better way for the implants to, I guess, integrate and connect with the human body. Because if you imagine having a, a big chunk of metal inside your body, it's not something that is, you know, naturally found in, in great abundance. You know, titanium doesn't really float freely throughout our body. So we're trying to find ways to, you know, coat that in different materials to be able to sort of make it a bit better. After that, you know, I was lucky enough that I was approached by a local law firm. And you sort of think of how, how did I go from engineering to law? What I did was I became something called a patent attorney. So a patent attorney is the person who, who writes those documents to protect your invention. So if you go out and you, you, know, you, you, you create the next cochlear implant, obviously it's not called cochlear, it's a trademark infringement, but you, you come up with a bionic implant that can suddenly make people hear much better than the uh, current cochlear device can, you want to make sure that you protect that so no one else around the world can make it, sell it, you know, make money out of it. And to do that, you need someone who can you know, write those documents. And the, the interesting thing about being a patent attorney, yes, you get a law degree. So now I have a law degree, a science degree, and an engineering degree. But you can't do that unless you have a background in STEM. All right, So you have to have studied engineering, science, IT, technology, to be able to even qualify as a patent attorney. It's a really cool career. You get to find out all the gossip and all the new technologies before anyone else does. But after five years, um, I sort of decided that I'd had enough. Um, in South Australia, we don't do English as a compulsory year 12 subject. So I had dropped out of English by year 10. So perhaps in hindsight, 
it wasn't a great um, career path to then spend the rest of my life writing very complicated legal documents. And, you know, I kind of missed being able to wear jeans to work. And I'll keep talking about, you know, engineering has this great ability to allow you to wear jeans to work, which is actually a very important selling point for me. But what, what I came back to was I decided to go back to engineering to be a researcher. And the reason I did that was because something called the Bionic Eye Project came about. And what that was, was, you know, the Australian government threw a heap of money um, into some universities to say, can we be the first in the world to give sight back to people who have lost their vision through different uh, various diseases of the retina, so the, the tissues in the back of the eye. And what we had to do was, you know, not only design and build, but also test these devices. And this is the whole reason why I'd become an engineer in the first place. You know, be, able to be involved in cool, high profile technology, get to do things that, you know, make a difference to people's lives. So when this project came up over at the University of Melbourne, you know, I, I had to be involved. So I, I sort of packed up and moved interstate um, to be part of this. And I spent five years on that project. Um, we developed a whole heap of really cool technology. We had, you know, 256 electrodes and, you know, chips that had never been built before to be able to stimulate neural tissue. It, it was a really amazing project to be part of. But what came out of that was this next generation of, I guess, bionic research in Australia. And you might have seen in the papers last week, there was a, a device called the Stentrode that was implanted in a whole heap of paralysed patients um, over in Melbourne. And what they were able to do was take what's normally a stent, a little device that keeps your arteries open inside your heart um, when you have issues with blood flow, but attach electrodes to that and feed it up through the, the blood vessels in the neck um, into the brain. And then they were able to show that you know, someone who is you know, significantly paralysed could then use brain waves to stimulate those electrodes. And then the electrodes would allow an exoskeleton, so a robotic sort of exoskeleton, to move. And that's really cool technology. And that's that spun out a heap of PhD students that um, were part of the of the Bionic Eye project. So the technology is just growing and growing. And you know, you guys are the generation that's going to do some really amazing things. So what I do now is I still use 3D printing. Um, I use it to be able to help people around me. So we work closely with a lot of you know special schools to allow you know disabled kids and you know, adults in the community to be able to participate in, in normal life. So, you know, it could be as simple as there's a project a few years back where this guy who was a quadriplegic wants to go to the pub and play pool. So he wanted us to develop a, a smart pool cue that can sit on the side of his wheelchair, can be folded away, but can aim and hit the ball um, basically by him using a, you know, a sip and puff. So a little device where you, you blow and it, it makes things happen. So that's really cool technology that I could never do if I wasn't an engineer. You're going to hear a heap of other really cool stuff from Daniel, so I won't go forever. But I guess that the project I'm working on at the moment that I'm really excited about, other than, of course, my 3D printing of Diamond, which I haven't really talked about much, but I'm sure I can talk about later, is we're now looking at you know, how can we take all these technologies and you know, work across multiple fields. Because the cool thing about engineering is that I might be a biomedical engineer, but it doesn't stop me working with mechanical engineers or in mechanical projects or in aerospace projects. And one example of that is we're currently working with aerospace engineers at RMIT. And what we're trying to do is take a CT scanner. So, you know, that big one um, ton thing you see in the basement of the hospital um, that, you know, do all the scanning for you and find a way to make that a lot lighter and then put it into helicopters or put it into fixed wing aircrafts and fly it out to remote communities, to indigenous communities, to be able to detect stroke in people who otherwise you know, would have a very negative outcome because their strokes wouldn't be treated, wouldn't be diagnosed, to try and make you know, healthcare a bit fairer around Australia and you know, have better outcomes irrespective of where you live. So I guess my, my takeaway point from all of this is that you know, engineering is a really broad field. You know, you've got the ability to do so many wonderful things um, that can really make a difference in whichever field you choose to go in. But you can always change. The cool thing about, you know, being in STEM is that you're not limited to one job for your whole career. You can move 
in and out of research. You can go to academia, you can go to industry, you can be like me and become a lawyer. Um, I've worked in commercialization, I've worked in physics departments. Um, you can always move around. So you're not limited to what you choose when you're 18 or 25 or 45. You know, you can keep moving as long as you're happy. So really my one takeaway is when you're choosing careers, you're choosing jobs, you know, do what makes you happy. So for me, I'm driven by, you know, seeing cool things on the news that I've worked on. I'm driven by helping people in the community and that stuff makes me happy. So do what makes you happy. You know, it's really hard now because you kind of want to do what you make your parents happy. I can tell you, as I said, I've got every degree you can imagine and it really hasn't made my dad any more or less happy. Um, it's, it's what makes you happy and it's really hard to get that perspective when you're still you know, trying to work out what you want to be. But if you ask me now, you know, what do you want to be when I grow up? I couldn't even tell you what my job will be in five years. You know, I'm always moving forward. I'm always moving sideways, but I'm having a great time doing it. So thank you very much. I'll let you chat to Daniel now. <laughs> thank you, Kate. Um, I think you, you struck a chord early uh, when Dan in the chat said that he hates maths <laughs> and, and said Alvin's counted with maths is okay, but specialist scares them. So <laughs> thank you. Put a, <laughs> that's it. You've put a few people's minds at, at ease a little bit that you don't have to love maths. Um, but, you know, math, maths never hurt anybody. A little bit of maths. <laughs> well, uh, off the back of that, I'm pretty sure that, that our next speaker is probably going to agree on that maths point. But our, our next speaker is Dr. Daniel Edgington Mitchell, who's from Monash University. And he's going to talk to us uh, about his work in mechanical and aerospace engineering. Good afternoon, Daniel. Afternoon, Camille. Uh, so I guess I better start talking about math since that's the <laughs> the topic. Uh, look, the one thing I would I do want to say about maths, and Kate's absolutely right. There are so many fields of engineering that range from not very mathematical to extremely mathematical. But some people say, you know, I don't like maths. I'm bad at maths. You're bad at almost everything the first time you try it, right? There's almost nothing that we do as humans that we're immediately good at. Some people have a natural advantage, others don't. But there's probably a kid in your class who can run further and faster than you, but chances are that's because they've done a lot more running than you have. Maths is like any form of exercise. If you do more of it, you'll get better at it and you'll, you know, you tend to enjoy things that you're good at. So don't ever think, oh, you know, uh, I'm bad at maths. I can't do it. If you want to be good at maths, practice, you'll end up good at maths, just like anything else a human being does. If you want to get better at it, practice it. All right. So... Um, I'm going to talk to you uh, about sort of a few things to do with engineering broadly and then a little bit about my own work. Um, to start with, just a little bit about me. Uh, I'm the course director for aerospace engineering at Monash University, so I'm responsible for the aerospace engineering degree there. Um, I do have degrees in both mechanical and aerospace engineering, so I, I'm sort of a bit in both, but there's a lot of overlap between them. So as part of my job there uh, at Monash, I teach thermodynamics and aerodynamics to our aerospace students. But being an academic, some of my time is spent teaching and some of my time is spent in research. And in my research, I look at the exhausts from jet engines and rocket engines. And I've also done some work on medical inhalers. And we'll talk a little bit about how those are linked. But first, before I get to talk about my favorite topic myself, let's talk a little bit more broadly. So what do engineers do? What is engineering? And I think the, the best way to describe it is to say that engineering is using science to solve problems. It's applying science and technology to make people's lives better or to make our society better. And this is sort of something that Kate talked about a bit. The range of different ways you can use science to help people is massive. And there's probably a whole lot of aspects of it that wouldn't normally occur to you until you stop to think about it. So a few examples of problems that engineers can help solve. Let's say your problem is you want to deliver medicine to a remote island. So some of the Pacific Islands to Australia's north, beautiful places, uh, but you can see the sort of terrain here, nowhere to really build a runway for an aircraft to land. The only way to access these islands is by boat, and the boat trip is long and slow. And if you have someone get sick on the island, they don't have the ability to manufacture medicine locally. They need the medicine to be delivered. But going by boat means it might arrive too late. So some aerospace engineers uh, who graduated from Monash actually uh, founded a small company called Swoop Aero, where they actually have 
little autonomous drones, uh, sorry, remotely piloted drones, not autonomous drones, that can transport uh, critical medical supplies, they can fly out, they can take off and land vertically, so they don't need a large clearing, and they can deliver that medicine in a few hours rather than a few weeks if they were going by boat. Maybe you decide, well, we don't want to rely on that, we want to connect the islands, we want to be able to drive there and deliver the medicine that way. Well, then you need a civil engineer. If you want to build a bridge spanning over water, you need the expertise of a civil engineer because building something over water that goes for kilometers is a pretty major project. You're now talking about very, very large scale engineering. And you can imagine the costs involved in something like this. You want to make sure you've got your calculations right. For your generation and for mine, probably the single most important engineering challenge is how do we generate clean power? Well, we could do it with Hydroelectric, for instance, that's going to need civil engineers for the structures, it's going to need mechanical engineers for the turbines, it's going to need electrical engineers for the power conversion. Wind power is certainly one of the fastest growing areas. Again, this is mechanical engineers. How do you design the aerodynamics of the turbine to extract the most energy from the wind? How do you lay out your wind farm? Because, of course, once the air blows through one, it's changed. And so when it gets onto the next, the next turbine, it's not the same that the turbine at the front would see. And then what I think is the coolest is solar thermal. So instead of burning uh, some fossil fuel to create heat to turn into electricity, just get a big mirror and focus all that sunlight to a point. And you can see here he's holding a piece of wood up at the focal point of that mirror. You can get this hot enough to melt metal. So you can replace burning fossil fuels with just focused sunlight. And this is not a solar panel. This is a solar thermal system. Of course, we have solar panels as well, a very efficient way to uh, convert, you know, solar radiance into electricity. And one of the interesting places uh, my engineering career has taken me was to East Timor, where you can see me here uh, helping out install some solar panels on the roof of a school in a little village called Maubisi, uh, a few hours out of Delhi. So this is what we would call humanitarian engineering. It's not about using cutting edge technology. It's about using appropriate technology. And we'll come back to that a little bit later. And this now ties very closely into what Kate's talked about. And this is really much more her expertise than mine. But if you want to help someone improve their lives and they've lost function through the loss of a limb, the loss of sight, the loss of hearing, the loss of you know operation uh, of their heart, giving them that functionality back can transform their lives. So biomedical engineers, and you can get into biomedical engineering by doing a biomedical degree, by doing a mechanical degree, by doing a mechatronics degree, uh, a whole range of different pathways. They build limbs that, you know, if you want to eat a big burger, you need two hands to hold it. Well, you can give someone back that ability. Uh, and this is a technology that's getting better all the time. It's very complex, very challenging engineering, but the impact you can have on someone's life is massive. And for me personally, you know, as a species, we want to go to new places. We've always been explorers, whether we're exploring the land or the sea or the sky. And of course, the next place to explore is space. And we've talked about how different branches of engineering require different amounts of maths. You need a lot of maths to do rocket science. There's, there's a huge amount of very complicated maths involved. Um, but it's challenging. It's also fun. So what kinds of engineers are there? all different kinds doing all different things. If you asked someone 20 years ago, what are the different sorts of engineering? They might've just said, oh, well, there's mechanical, chemical, civil, electrical, and materials. So mechanical engineers deal with systems with moving parts. Chemical engineers deal with chemical processes and refinement. Civil engineers build structures, roads, bridges, tunnels. Electrical engineers deal with computer systems, communication systems, uh, and all electrical systems. And materials engineers develop new materials that are lighter and stronger. But now, if you said what sorts of engineers are there, you could add a list that might look something like this. So you've already heard from Kate, she's a biomedical engineer. Mechatronics engineering means you focus on robots. Robots do a lot for us these days. Aerospace engineers, like me, are concerned with rockets, aeroplanes, helicopters. Software engineers are an engineer's take on programming. Environmental engineers, increasingly important. They're a sort of mix of mechanical and chemical and civil and electrical, uh, but they focus on minimizing environmental impact. So some work that I've been a little bit involved in is humanitarian engineering. And this is where you go to a developing community and you try to use engineering principles to improve their well-being in some way. 
And this often doesn't mean going in with some, you know, fancy top of the line technology and installing it and leaving, because chances are there's no one there with the expertise or the resources to maintain that technology. So humanitarian engineering is about going to a community and saying, what are you good at? What do you need? And what technologies do you have around you that we can support you with that you'll be able to maintain on your own? Australia is an island nation, so maritime engineering, you know, operation of ships and offshore platforms is obviously very important for us. And the mining industry is big in Australia, so you could choose to focus in that area as well. So a whole range of things that have a whole lot of different skills required. Do humanitarian engineering, well, you need a bit of anthropology and sociology and sort of cultural empathy to do electrical engineering. You need to do circuit analysis. That's a lot of very complex mathematics. So who can be an engineer? Well, really, anyone who wants to use science to solve problems. Okay? Engineering is for everyone. It doesn't matter if you think you're good at maths or you think you're bad at maths. It doesn't matter what your gender is, your race, your cultural background, your sexual identity. If you want to use science to solve problems, we want to work with you. We want to see you come to university and study engineering and go on to make the world a better place. So I just want to mention a few technologies that you probably enjoy using uh, and the engineers behind them it might surprise you a little bit. So if you like using Wi-Fi, and I bet you do like using Wi-Fi, then you can thank Hedy Lamarr for the fact that we have Wi-Fi. So Hedy Lamarr was a movie star in the 1930s and 1940s, and everyone made a big deal about how talented and beautiful she was as an actress. But really what was far more important was her talent as a mathematician and as an engineer. And she developed uh, a technology called frequency hopping, which was designed at the time uh, to be used in the Second World War by the Allied powers to overcome jamming. But instead, where it's really found its home is it's the technology that underpins how we encrypt Wi-Fi signals. So if you like using Wi-Fi, you can use Wi-Fi because of Hedy Lamarr. Sticking with the electrical side of things, if you like high-speed internet, you can thank Charles Cow. So Charles was an electrical engineer, uh, but he won the Nobel Prize for Physics for his work in optical fibers. And of course, optical fiber uh, is the backbone of high-speed internet. If you like using computers at all, you can thank Margaret Hamilton. So Margaret Hamilton uh, was a programmer who worked on the Apollo program, and she's credited as essentially inventing the discipline of software engineering. Before Margaret Hamilton, no one called themselves a software engineer, but that specialization and that expertise, she really founded the whole discipline. And in this photo over here, she's standing behind a printed stack of all of the code she wrote for the Apollo program. Uh, and when something went wrong on the mission, it was only because of the programs she'd written that they were able to go ahead with the landing. But if you look at how much paper there is there, next time you're complaining about how much homework you've got, spare a thought for poor old Margaret Hamilton. So those are some technologies that, you know, have changed our lives, which you can thank engineers for. But just as an example of sort of the kinds of places engineering can, can take you, Robert Satcher was a NASA astronaut, uh, but he was also a chemical engineer. He held a doctorate in chemical engineering, and he was an orthopedic surgeon. So a bit of an all-round superstar. Uh, but astronaut is the kind of you know place that you might like to end up as an engineer, uh, and the skill set you develop as an engineer in terms of problem solving and critical thinking can take you all kinds of places. So why did I want to be an engineer? Well, originally, because this is what I imagined myself doing. I, when I was a little kid, I wanted to be an astronaut, and I never really got over that. So I went to study aerospace engineering as a pathway to end up at NASA as an astronaut. You can see from this, uh, clearly, my Photoshop skills are not the best, so graphic design was, was right out for me. But while I was studying aerospace engineering, I undertook a research project to look at these little structures in the exhausts of rockets and jet engines. You might have seen photos like this before. What you can see here are called Mark Diamonds or Mark Discs. And these are a form of shock wave that forms in high-speed exhausts. And I started a project in my undergraduate year studying these, and I thought they were so interesting that I decided to do a PhD uh, studying them, and it's ended up becoming my career. So to look at these, we use a special technique called Schlieren photography, amongst various other things we do with lasers and computer simulations. Schlieren is based on the same principle that makes air shimmer on a hot day. If you ever look down you know, a, a black surface like a road on a hot day, you see the air shimmering. This is the same principle that underpins Schlieren photography. But we use special lenses and optics to really accentuate those fluctuations that you can see. And in this example photo here, you can see this girl's holding a hairdryer. 
that's producing a blast of hot air and you can actually see the stream coming out and then how it's interacting with her as it goes past. So we use this to study the exhausts of these engines. So here is a color version of the technique. I think it's a particularly pretty image on the top left here. On the top right, we have a video that we produced in our laboratory using one of our special cameras that can go at a million frames a second. So we can use this to zoom right in and look at these very fast supersonic processes that are happening. And one of the cool things we've done with this is if we're interested in rocket launch, we want to know how one of these supersonic exhausts interacts with a surface. These tend to produce incredible amounts of noise. And with the space shuttle, it actually produced so much noise that the noise itself could damage the structures. And they used to deal with this by dumping millions of liters of water onto the launch pad, not because they were worried about heat, but because they were worried about sound. And so we're interested in studying that sound. And here with our million frame a second camera, you see these white lines that are moving up to the top of the screen here. Those are actually waves of sound. So our camera is fast enough that we can watch waves of sound propagate through the air. Uh, and then that helps us study them and understand how to minimize them. So that's just a little taste of some of the work I do in aerospace. But one of the interesting places this took me was to work on asthma puffers. So you probably know uh, someone who suffers from asthma or you do yourself. And you would know that the way we treat asthma is with an asthma puffer. Asthma puffers are very effective at their treatment, but they're not very efficient because most of the medicine that's contained in this little puff never reaches your lungs. It gets stuck to your teeth, to your tongue, to the back of your throat. So we've worked with pharmaceutical scientists to try and understand why this happens. And here we have a high speed visualization of what comes out the end of an asthma puffer. And, you know, we can freeze it an instant here and it's just a cloud of very, very tiny droplets of liquid. And a lot of these droplets just hit the back of your throat. They don't manage to make the curve uh, to go into your lungs. So we were interested in why that is. And after we studied that a bit, we thought we want to make a better asthma puffer. But we realized that we were looking too late in the process. Once it's already come out, all the things that determine where those droplets will go have already happened. What we really needed to do was look inside the asthma puffer. But that's hard, right? Because it's made out of plastic. We can't see inside it if we look with the naked eye with visible light. So we actually went to the synchrotron in Chicago, which is like the world's brightest light source. Instead of using visible wavelengths of light, it uses x-rays produced by the synchrotron. And using this, we're able to zoom right in to the very point where the medical spray comes out of the asthma puffer. And using very high speed imaging in the synchrotron, we could look through the plastic and see what was happening. And so here you can see these little droplets that are containing the medicine, as they reach this, here, this one's my favorite, so I'll play it back, as they reach the inlet to the nozzle, you can see this little droplet here, the very high velocities there sort of tear it apart. It looks like a little jellyfish being broken up as it goes through the nozzle. So people had always thought that it was the exit of the nozzle that determined the size of the droplets. But what we found is it's actually the entrance to the nozzle where the processes that dictate the size of the drug containing droplets are formed, and on this basis, we've just come up with a new design uh, for an asthma puffer with different nozzle geometries that's just going in for peer review now that actually does a better job of delivering medication to the lungs. So these are just a few examples uh, of the research I do. I work on rockets, I work on detonation engines, I work on supersonic jet noise. But I've used some of those same tools that we use to study a rocket engine to study the nozzle in an asthma puffer, which is kind of like a really small, really cold rocket nozzle. So I never made it to space, but, you know, my dream was always to get to NASA. And I can say at least I was able to do that when they invited me there to talk to them about some of my work on supersonic uh, jets in, you know, aircraft and rockets. So with that, um, I'm looking forward to answering any questions that you may have. And thanks for listening. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, we've had a lot of questions coming through uh, for both you and Kate. So if, um, everyone's really engaged with, with what you've been speaking about. Um, our first one, and I might start with you, Daniel, uh, is if you did the v VCE, Martin wants to know what subjects did you use and did you have to do physics in order to do your space-related one, Daniel? <laughs> so that's a really good question, Martin. Um, the entrance requirements for most engineering degrees, at least in Victoria, are quite flexible. So I know at Monash we require you to have either done chemistry or physics and at least one maths. So if you just done, say, chemistry and math methods, then you could still 
apply and enroll in engineering. But you do need physics to do this sort of thing and you do need specialist maths. So if you haven't done them in school, the way we deal with it is uh, we teach you in first year the material that you would have learned in year 12 in those units. And that means you lose out on doing one or two electives that the students who have done specialist or physics do. Uh, so you don't need it to get into engineering, but if you want to do aerospace, then absolutely you will need to learn all the material from specialist or physics at some point. Uh, for my VCE, I did chemistry, physics, methods, specialist, English, and theatre studies. <laughs> Well, it's always good to do a creative subject, definitely. Absolutely. <laughs> now, Kate, I know that you were in, in South Australia uh, when you did yours, uh, but what subjects did you do for, I'm not sure what it's called in SA, actually. SACE. It's called SACE. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did Maths 1, Maths 2, so I guess that's specialist in Dylan. Um, biology, physics and geography. Well, there you go. <laughs> As I said, South Australia, English isn't compulsory. So you've got to pick one humanity and uh, geography was it. Hey, not a bad one, geography. I could with maps. <laughs> um, so Taylor's Lake Secondary College has logged in with 15 students watching um, and they were very happy with the insights and it's very amazing what you guys are doing. Uh, but they're asking what emerging area areas of engineering would you recommend? So maybe, Kate, what areas are kind of in their infancy, infancy in, on your side of things? Sure. I mean, the, the big thing at the moment is machine learning and predictive technology. So really, we're, we've been setting sort of the groundwork for this next generation for you guys to come in and make it smarter. So trying to make electrical systems smaller, so really small lab-on-chip technologies, personalised medicine, um, personalised technology is the, the next big thing. Obviously, bioprinting, if it can sort of break through some of those limitations of, you know, blood supply and, you know, longevity in the body. But really, it's machine learning, it's artificial intelligence, um, it's all those sort of technologies that's pushing engineering forward at the moment. But the, I mean, I don't know. The cool thing about engineering is that you do solve, you know, problems that don't exist right now. <laughs> Well, that's it, isn't it? We don't know what they're going to be. But Daniel, have you got something that's the next frontier on, on your side? Of... Uh, I mean, I, I'd agree with Kate broadly that I think uh, AI, um, of which machine learning is a subset, is, is definitely one of the strongest growth areas. Uh, in industry, they're very interested in something called digital twins. So if you have a system that you want to test, if you can build a very, very accurate digital representation of it, that's a lot cheaper than, you know, building a prototype. And, and you know, if you test a prototype to destruction, you don't have the prototype anymore. If you test your digital twin to destruction, you just restart the program and you're good to go. Um, but modeling things computationally, I mean, a model by definition means it doesn't include all of the real physics, all of the real mechanisms. So building accurate digital models uh, and machine learning is one way that you can go about doing that is uh, something of increasing value. I think additive manufacturing is obviously one of the other big growth areas, but uh, if I had to pick a few, I would say uh, AI and digital twins, additive manufacturing and biomedical engineering uh, are some of the biggest growth areas. Beautiful, all that coding and things, it's way beyond me. <laughs> uh, so. Dan has a question for Kate, and he wants to know what the coolest thing you've 3D printed for yourself is. <laughs> so you can't see under my desk at the moment. I've got all <laughs> kinds of weird and wonderful things floating around. So every year I host the Indigenous Winter School, and so all these kids come in from places around Australia, and all they want to do is print, you know, Harry Potter rubbish and <laughs> Pokemons. So I've got all these Pokemons under my desk at the moment. Um, I guess... Uh, I, I, I like printing anything. Like, I, I like printing implants. I like printing, you know, stuff for my kids. I like printing cute little dinosaurs. <laughs> you know, I'm, I've got the immaturity of about a 12-year-old. <laughs> it does sound kind of very fun, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> um, so Martin's asked, um, probably this is more for Daniel's line, but what's the most efficient, sustainable fuel at the moment and um, what's the future of energy? Is it in fact those solar thermal cells or is wind still got a way to go? Uh, so that, that's a great question. Um, 
in terms of energy sources, I, I, you know, look, I'm I'm not a specialist in that area, so I'm just speaking as a generalist here. Um, I think solar and wind will have to become our dominant energy sources. Uh, how much of that is photovoltaic solar versus solar thermal? Probably more photovoltaic solar at the moment, so just solar panels. Um, Something like hydro, you can only do in a very specific area, and there are, you know, there are major environmental impacts from hydro, even if you're not generating CO2. So, I think um, in terms of generating energy, it will be solar and wind. But generating it is only one part of the story. You also need to be able to move energy around. So, if we look in the aerospace industry, for instance, uh, it's quite practical to drive an electric car with some batteries in it. But batteries are really, really heavy compared to fossil fuels. And when we want to make things fly, weight just dominates all other considerations. You cannot fly on an international flight with an electric aircraft. You just can't do it. I think they've they've done some estimates. They said if you took an A380, which is our biggest passenger aircraft, and you took out all the passengers and all the fuel and you put in batteries and ran electric engines, you could make it to Canberra. And those aircraft, you know, can fly to the United States without stopping normally. So how do we look at an industry like aerospace and make it sustainable? Can we use hydrogen as a fuel, for instance? So you can burn hydrogen uh, and it just produces water. So that's not so bad. Um, how would you produce the hydrogen? You could do electrolysis and drive that by solar power. Um, but alternatively, maybe you want to grow a biofuel. So people are looking into various processes using algae or using fast growing plants where you're still essentially producing a hydrocarbon fuel that you burn. It produces CO2, but then you grow it again very quickly and that captures all of the CO2 back out of the environment. So there are different challenges in different industries and there's how we generate the power in the first place. And that will have to be dominantly uh, solar and wind with perhaps some contribution from nuclear, but then there's also how do we use the energy once we have it? How do we transport it? So burning hydrogen, hydrogen fuel cells, battery storage, all sorts of other technologies for you all to work on. All those future STEM careers just waiting for us. <laughs> uh, so Jack's asked us kind of a nice little fun question, which is who is your favourite engineer? And we've heard a couple of Daniel's examples, so we might start with Kate if she's got a favourite. I'm actually more into physicists. So I, I always <laughs> loved Marie Curie. I always thought it was so fantastic that she could pick up two two Nobel Prizes in, in different different fields. I, I love the tragedy of the story. But do you, do you know who my most favourite is? And it's going to sound really silly. Penny from Expector Gadget. I love the fact she had that computer book. <laughs> like, I'm big on that. Um, and, yeah, and that sort of stuff, you know, Ellie Sattler in Jurassic Park, you know, having to go across and, you know, feed the dinosaurs for a research grant. All this sort of stuff has always been inspiring. <laughs> Definitely. The fictional ones are good, just as good as the real ones. <laughs> Penny was way cool. <laughs> she was. I forgot about Penny. <laughs> Daniel, if you had to pick one, do you have one? I would actually pick a mathematician, um, mm -hmm. uh, simply because I think she needs a lot more recognition. So Emmy Noether was a contemporary of Albert Einstein uh, working in Germany. Uh, one of the most brilliant mathematicians who's ever lived. Um, I can't understand most of what she did, but her theorems give us the mathematical underpinnings for things like conservation of energy, conservation of mass, conservation of momentum. And all of my research in fluid mechanics and thermodynamics is, essentially goes back to those three ideas, that mass, energy, and momentum are conserved properties. And it's only because of Emmy Noether that we know that that's true. But she was you know, working in the early 20th century, uh, where, you know, um, views on gender were, you know, we still have a long way to go, but they had a lot further to go then. She would, wouldn't even be paid for her work uh, because of her gender. So despite being one of the most brilliant mathematicians who's ever lived, she had to, you know, work for free for half her life. Um, so everyone knows names like Newton and Einstein, but I'd argue that Emmy Noether is uh, just as important for our understanding of the modern world. Uh, and, you know, she was a real classic scientist. She'd have her hair all frizzy and she'd be so excited talking about maths that she wouldn't care. And at the time that was all very scandalous. So uh, Emmy Noether is my, my favorite. There's definitely one for us to all Google after the, after the webcast, but, and yes, definitely don't have to brush your hair, which we've all got good at. Uh, so Taylor's Lake College has another question, which is, um, 
directly more to Daniel. Are there any aviation related developments that could be equal or more prolific as the airfoil? Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, no, would be my short answer. Um, it's a really good question, but almost everything we're looking at doing in the aviation space still use an air, uses an airfoil in some way. So even if Can we're talking fun? about, you know, quadcopters or drones or, um, you know, personal transport where we're using rotary systems, it's still an airfoil. So, uh Airfoils are just a fantastic way to generate lift. And if you want to fly in an environment with gravity and an atmosphere, you need a way to generate lift. And they're just extraordinarily efficient at doing that. So um, it's a great question, but I would say no, I don't think so. I think the airfoil will continue to be the single most important innovation of atmospheric flight. And I'll just put in a little plug here, um, the Stellar kits uh, we have a wind energy one and one on renewables which uses a wind turbine so you can study angles and number of blades and all of that and then also if you've got the wherewithal 3d print your own blades and test them out to see all of that stuff so get find them on the stellar great. website <laughs> um, so martin has a question which is what is the biggest project each of you have been involved in and i might start with kate because i know you talked about being on the news so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean so I I guess the bionic eye was something that was huge. You know, the Australian government gave $50 million to us to be able to get this technology going. And we had, you know, at, at the peak, you know, 120 staff of which, you know, 60 of them were, were students. So being part of something with such momentum um, and you know, with, with the possibility to really change lives was, you know, really fascinating and, you know, everyone's heard of the Australian Bionic Eye Project. So to be part of that, yeah, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. <laughs> Daniel, do you have do you have a favourite child in your project? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, nothing that can compare to the Bionic Eye in terms of scale and impact, to be honest. Um, Kate has done more than I have, there's no doubt about it. Um, I guess probably the biggest I've been involved in was a project in Berlin to develop uh, pulse detonation engines, which are an alternative uh, to gas turbines that are a bit more fuel efficient. Um, and because of my expertise in shock waves and high speed flow, they've flown me out to Germany a few times to work on that. So I guess that's probably the biggest. I think that was 20 million euro or something, that project. Um, but biggest doesn't mean it's my favorite. Uh, some of the fundamental work we do on supersonic jet noise sponsored by the Australian Research Council is, is my true passion, I guess. I just think the physics are beautiful. Lovely, beautiful physics. Who says that? <laughs> um, so Jack's wanting to know, what do you think is the most interesting field of engineering apart from the one they're in? So if you weren't in this field, as we know, we're all flexible, what would you pick first? Maybe we'll go with, with Daniel as his <laughs> something astronaut. Um, <laughs> it's, that's a really hard question to answer. I mean, I've dabbled in a few different fields. So... Um, What's the most interesting? I don't know. I think the fastest developing fields in terms of where there's the most movement at the moment are probably around automation, mechatronics, and AI. Uh, if someone said, you know, which do you think is the biggest growth area where the most new things are happening? That's probably what I would choose. Um, but you could make the same argument for biomedical engineering. But if I had to pick one, I'll say mechatronics and automation is the most rapidly changing field right now. Beautiful. Kate, did you have one you wanted to be in your next like, so my, my first preference when I finished high school was actually mechatronics because I didn't know what it was. And now I know what it is, I would really have hated it. So, you know, lady luck is, is, is pretty good sometimes. So, I mean, I think mechatronics is really cool. I think the ability to combine, you know, biomedical engineering with, you know, mechanical systems, you know, be able to directly interface with nerves using you know ai and smart tech is really cool i actually think civil engineering is really interesting um, now that i am older and i understand that civil engineering isn't just you know making bridges and designing roads uh, i think all the stuff they do in traffic management is, is really fascinating um, in terms of you know be able to predict what someone's going to do on the road i think all the, the smart self-driving cars are amazing I said, I'm, I'm very dictated by science fiction and seeing all these engineers out there 
that are doing these technologies, you know, make me want to be part of it. it it's definitely we're, we're getting the, the, the mechatronics and autom automation in things. Um, so our final question is going to be from Taylor's Lakes, which says, um, is Australia a good place for engineers? You guys have talked about doing stuff overseas, but is there a growing scope to work here in industries, both privately and also in government? I know you guys are researchers in academia, but you've worked with industry. Who do you want to go first? Uh, maybe we'll go with Daniel first. <laughs> okay. Um, look, engineering as a career path in Australia has remained incredibly stable uh, as a path to choose. There is plenty of engineering work in Australia and there's plenty of engineering, interesting engineering work in Australia. So even in aerospace, which people typically tend to say, oh, you know, aerospace in Australia, there's no jobs. In Victoria alone, we have Boeing, Lockheed Martin, BAE, GKN, Morand, Kinetic, Thales, and Gipsero, Five Rings, uh, and I'm sure I'm forgetting some. Uh, there's tons of world-leading engineering work that's done in Australia. Uh, it's just in my particular area of, you know, supersonic jets and, and detonation engines, there's not much local industry, which is why I do a lot of work internationally. But Australia punches well above its weight in, in engineering disciplines. There's a lot of really good, interesting work to be done here. Um, and in terms of a career path, you absolutely won't have to go abroad to find interesting engineering work. You will be able to take an Australian degree abroad. They're recognised and, and respected internationally. But if you like living in Australia, and I certainly do, um, there's tons of great engineering work here in all different facets of engineering. I'm, I'm sure, Kate, you're going to agree with him here. And, and yeah, definitely moving steps. partially. <laughs> I, I guess it depends, on, it depends on the field of engineering you go into. You know, obviously, the more narrow you go down, the less options you have at the end. And that's fine because there are jobs out there, you know, in Victoria in particular, there's a massive you know, government investment into, you know, additive manufacturing, manufacturing full stop, biomedical technologies. You know, the, the jobs are here. Um, things like, you know, bioprinting, you know, at the moment, the jobs aren't there, unless you want to go into academia. Um, if you have a specialisation in bioprinting, there's no immediate industry you're going to jump into. But that's fine because in five years, 10 years, there will be. You know, we're constantly moving forward. You know, Australia's got a really good defence industry. So there's always jobs in defence. Um, the, the jobs are there, particularly with engineering, because you have that jack of all trades degree. Um, everyone knows what mechanical engineers do or, or chemical engineers do. You know, you won't have any trouble getting a job in that field. Particularly if you're female, I'm just going to say it, if you're female in engineering, you know, you're going to have an advantage going forward because, you know, diversity is a very important thing that is really, you know, on trend at the moment. Always good to hear as a fellow female. Sorry, Daniel. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that it's the single most important thing we can do to grow our profession is to convince more young women to do it and yes of course there are many barriers you face as a woman that you don't face as a man but Kate's absolutely right that once you're applying for jobs it's not a disadvantage it's an advantage uh, because there's a whole lot of companies that are desperate to you know replace their aging male workforce with a, a young diverse workforce that's always good news. So um, I just wanted to finish up here and thank you both for your time today and, um, and giving us an insight into your work and also thank all of our viewers for the fantastic questions that have been coming through that many more we even didn't even get to. Uh, we're going to now finish up by showing a quick video about entrepreneurship and engineering whilst we're talking about industry. And thank you all for, for logging in and we'll be able to uh, work, view this on demand later on. And definitely don't forget to visit stella.org.au. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks everyone. We started off with really basic components that you can learn how to use on Google and, and YouTube. I started cold calling schools. I didn't even have a website, a business card or even a proper business name. I didn't know that I was going to be a seaweed farmer. You're researching and talking about seaweed production but you never really knew it was me that was going to do it. I felt like there were problems in business and industry that were slowing me down, like too many protocols, too many pathways, too much risk aversion. When I started the business, it opened up a whole new dimension of learning and experiences around entrepreneurship and how you actually 
translate some of that research into, into business and into the real world to go and implement it. And that was really exciting. Branching out and starting your own company is, is not the norm for science. And in a country like Australia, there's some really good incentives to do it. Science can talk about how we should do things or the theory of what might happen if we do this, but it's actually getting out there and doing it that will make the difference. I think the best part of my job is that when someone asks you what your typical day look like, it's so hard to answer. Um, and it's because it's so varied, which is so exciting. Working with people, leading teams, negotiating, technical knowledge, so product development, you know, legal. Whatever problem comes up that day, you've got to work out how to solve it. My advice to everybody is to find a niche that they love and find a way in which there's a pathway that they can actually see that becoming a skill or a job that they want to do in the future and apply themselves to that. So you've got to love what you do, even though you're challenged by it. And you've got to be challenged by what you love, otherwise life is very, very boring. Um, in entrepreneurship, we talk about this concept called finding your tribe. If you're interested in something, there are a lot of other people in the world who are also interested in it too. It's super fun. You get to work with the, the person that you pick to work with and, and you get to work on something that's that you get to direct how it goes. There's a lot of stories about, you know, when you're in business or you're an entrepreneur that you've got to hustle and, you know, you've got to be that big extroverted personality. But, you know, that's not me. And I think if I can just be myself, if I'm genuine in my values and my behavior, then that can also allow me to thrive in this environment of being a business owner. When you can really see how much other people appreciate the work that you're putting in, just knowing that I'm making an impact and that I'm, I'm doing everything that I can to, to leave the world in a better place, it makes it all worth it.